We are on Mishnah 18 of the first parak of Pirkei Avot. This is the final mission in our parak. Very exciting. Let's see what it says. Rabban Shimon ben Gamliel Omer. Uh, so by the way, just as an intro comment, um, the, the Mepharshim seem to be split about whether or not this Rabban Shimon ben Gamliel is actually the same Rabban Shimon we saw in the previous Mishnah. It says, says Shimon ben Omer. Um, but there seem to be many Mepharshim who actually understand that this is not the same uh, Shimon. So that's just an intro comment. So what does he say? Haolam kayam. On three things the world exists. By the way, again, there are also uh, apparently different versions of this. There are those that say But I think the predominant kirsi here actually is haolam kayam, and you'll understand why in a second. So what are these three things? Al hadin val haemet val hashalom. On justice, on truth, and on peace. Shene Amar, it's a puzzle in Zacharia, Emet Umish Bashalom Shivtu Bisharechem. Execute the judgment of truth and peace in your gates. That's our Mishnah. Now, if we're thinking, hey, this actually sounds kind of familiar, correct, it should sound familiar, because the second Mishnah in this parak, and the second Mishnah of Pirki Avot in general, is Shimon Hatzadi Kayami Shari Knesset Agdola. Shimon the Righteous was one of the last of the men of the Great Assembly. Hu Haya Omer. On three things the world stands. So that is very interesting. Why is it that we have two seemingly very similar Mishnahs with very different itemized lists? Those are not the same. There isn't even any overlap. Not even a single item appears on, um, on both lists. So how do we understand that? So for commentary here, we'll actually turn to a, a most unusual source for commentary on Pirkei Avot. The source itself is not unusual, but as a commentary on Pirkei Avot, it is. Um, and that's the Torah. The Torah is a massive halakhic work com composed by the son of the Rosh. Um, just as a quick preamble, so there are three main poskim that the Shulchan Aruch based his, um, the Shulchan Aruch on. The Rith, the Rambam and the Rosh, Rabbeinu Asher. And the Rosh's son is the Tor, and the Tor authored the, the Tor, no surprise there. Um, that wasn't his actual name, but that's the name he was given because of his massive work. The Tor has Arba Torim, right? There are four pillars, there are four uh, main bodies to it, main sections. Um, and this is actually the, the basis of the format of the Shulchan Aruch. That is to say, there are four main ones. The one we're probably most familiar with is Orach Chaim, right? The way of the way or the ways of life, and that details all the halachas that were encountered on a daily and weekly basis. It goes through the laws of tefillah, of, or rather, it starts with getting up in the morning, and then with da with davening, and with um with the laws of the chagim and shabbat, and all the things we interact with on a regular basis. Another one is Choshen Mishpat, and that deals with monetary law. It deals with the laws of um, of the courts, right, of appointing judges, and of of many of the sogias that are related to tort law, to monetary law, to transactions, to commerce, this is where you're going to find it. You're going to find it in the Choshen Mishpat. And the way the tour actually opens the Choshen Mishpat, less Simon Aleph, Seif Aleph, it's the first thing he says, and he says as follows, it should sound familiar. Rabban Shimon ben Gamliel Omer, that's our Mishnah. There you go. That's how he opens. It's a halachic work, and he's opening with the Mishnah of Pirkei Avot, which is not halachic in nature. Very interesting. Uh, that itself is a whole commentary on itself. We're not going to go there. And he continues. Pirsha Rabbeinu Yona. Right? Rishon, Rabbeinu Yona. Zal. In Pirusha, Shabishvilashloshad Varim Elon Nivra Olam. Um, it, the, it is, we are not to interpret this Mishnah as this is why the world was created. Why not? Right, because at the very beginning of the, of the Perik of Perik Yavot, right, that, that second Mishnah we saw, Shimon Atzadik, um, he says this is why the world was created, right? This is what the world stands on. And it's not these that he mentions here in this final Mishnah. So, so Elamit Chila Amar Shemishvil Shloshat Dvarim Nivra Olam Ben a Torah the Avoda the Gilan Chasadim. Right, the world was uh, the world was created for Torah and Avoda and Gilan Chasadim. 
such an important way of, uh, of opening your, your book on monetary law. It's important to make sure that justice is done, but that's not the end goal, and we'll get to that in a second. And, um, and for a commentary on the tour and this Mishnah and Rabbeinu Yona, we actually turn to, again, another unusual source, one I don't think we've ever quoted before, but it's the Prisha. Um, the Prisha and the Drisha are twin commentaries on the tour. They are written by the same person, not surprisingly. Um, his name was Rabbi Yoshua Falk, Cats uh, of Poland. I think I've seen some where that they just exclude uh, cats, so it's Rabbi Yoshua Falk. But regardless, a massive and major commentator, not only on the tour with his Prisha and Drisha, but also on Chosh and Mishpat in the Shulchan Aruch. There, his work is called the Sefer Me'irat Enaim, um, and the Sma. It's one of the two um, Nose Kalim of the Chosh and Mishpat. You'll see the Sma and the Shach. And they are the two commentaries on the, the, the two major commentaries on the, uh, or two of the major commentaries on Chosh and Mishpat and the Shulchan Aruch. But he has other commentaries, and they are the Prisha and the Drisha, and we'll be looking at the Prisha. Um, so here's what he says. Very interesting. He really wants to orient us to to um to Rabbi Yonah. and he says that the 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 basis upon which Rabbi Yona is is uh is stating this that is to say that the world is created for um for the Torah and Avodah and Gun Chasadim is actually another Mishnah in Pirkei Avot right it's in the sixth parak it's either uh, Mishnah fourteen or eleven depending on your version um but he says like this that Mishnah there says uh, that Everything that Akash Baruch Hu, um, that God created in His world, He created for His glory, and that's why, as you will see, Rabbi Yona links all three of these items in the Mishnah, right, the Torah, Avod, and Pinot Chasadim, to our relationship with Akash Baruch Hu. The first two are fairly obvious, but the third is much less intuitive. How is Milut Chasadim? How is like acts of loving kindness? How does that connect us to God? I mean, we can understand perhaps um, more abstractly how it does, but how does it directly do so? Um, we'll get to there in a second. This is just a, an opening. And the preacher also says that why did God have to create these things? Or why are these three things the reason for the creation of the world? Um, why did God have to create the world to begin with? And so here the priest, I guess, takes like a really large step back and tries to give us context in terms of the creation of man of humanity was was meant by the Baruch Hu to give glory to God, right? That was the whole point. The point was to manifest God's glory. Now, what does that mean? What, what does that mean? Does God needs us? And the answer is no, chas shalom. But the idea is, um, this is the priest, and I'll admit this isn't fully, um, hasn't fully settled into my mind. I don't 100% understand it. But the idea is, and this is a fairly common idea, that there's potential and there's actualization, right? When there's a thing exists in potential, that's amazing. When you see a person with great potential, you're like, this is incredible. But the idea is, you want to help them flesh out that, that potential that they have. You want, you want them to actualize it. And if God did not create humanity, right, and did not create a world, and he just kind of openly blasted out his glory, then according to the Prisha, God would have, uh, I want to be very cautious how... I say this, but God would have stayed in in potential mode only. It would have been koach. It would not have been actual manifest. Um, his glory would never become manifest. It would not it would not have been actualized. And so, in creating man, the ability for God's uh, glory to become manifest and become revealed in the world uh, became a possibility. And that's why God created the world. And that's what's being alluded to through the, these ideas of. Torah and Avodah and Pilun Chasadim. That's a very large overarching picture. Again, I will openly admit I don't fully understand it, but that's how the Prisha opens up his commentary. Okay, so with that, how do we go? Okay, so God created God created man, Torah and Avodah and Pilun Chasadim. We'll be learning, we'll be davening, we'll be doing acts of kindness. So there's a problem. The Prisha quotes famous Pasuk in Parsha Noach. That is to say, Man is evil from his youth. It's an explicit positive. God says it himself. Um, and that's a big issue. Man is evil from his youth. And what that means is we're full of jealousy. We compete with each other. We're full of anger. And therefore, the fact that man will actually fulfill his, his mission on earth, which is to bring glory to God, uh, is up for question because there are so many other things competing 
and find for, for man's attention, that he may never be able to get to his ultimate destination. And therefore, we need three more things. And that's what our mission is dealing with. That is to say, the world exists for three things. Din, Emet, and Shalom. What does that mean? Um, if it weren't for those things, it would be impossible for us to accomplish our task. It would be, be impossible for us to accomplish anything. Because there would be no rest and there would be no respite. And amazingly, the Prishtha continues to say, and if that's true, then man, and man could not pursue our goals because of all these side problems and distractions, then the whole world would, would not be fitting to exist. Right? The, both Mishnas, both the second Mishnah with Shimon Atzadik and our Mishnah with Rabbi Shimon Ben Gamliel, they say, Ha'olam Omed, or Ha'olam Kayam. If man did not exist, or man was not able to fulfill the reason for his existence, then what do we care about the world? God created the world to sustain man. Right? You create man, you don't create food for him to live with, uh, or to, uh, food for him to eat in order to live, or any sh shelter that he could build for himself, then man would encounter a problem. And therefore, God created a world in order to serve man, so man could, in turn, serve God. And that's why the, both missions say, Ha'olam Omer, or Ha'olam Ka'yam. Because it's not just, okay, the Mishnah could have said, Hamin Hayanoshi, right? It just could have said humanity. God created humanity for the following reasons. But it's not only humanity, it's humanity as well as virtually everything else. That's why we have a world. Fine. And so the preacher says, and from here we understand that the reason why we have Din, Emin, and Shalom is in order to make sure that man is able to accomplish his task. And the reason why this is so interesting is because the preacher says, Din, Emin, and Shalom, it's not good enough. It's not good enough. Creating the world for justice, you know, justice is very important. Let's just say we had a world that was just. Okay, the world is just. There's there's world peace, right? People are exploring the truth. There are not a bunch of liars. That's great. But now what? For what purpose? And it's important to realize that as much as we speak about the importance of, of these things, especially, let's think of peace, peace. Let's really break it down. If we have peace, what kind of nation sets out in their mission statement, in their constitution, our goal is to be at peace with everyone else. Okay, good. So you're at peace with everybody else. You're at peace with all of your neighbors, with all the countries in the world. Okay, like now, I mean, now what? Now what's the goal for your citizens? What do they engage themselves with? They've already accomplished their goal. Instead, and this is related not only on a macro level of the world, but also on the, on the micro level in terms of our, our marriages and our relationships with other people. If all we're looking to do is peace, then it becomes self-defeating in terms of you achieve peace and now what? And so I heard from her Bernstein, it's really interesting. He says, it is important, this is his um, sheer on dating and marriage, it is important to have a strong foundation of Shalom Bayit. So her Bernstein said, it's very important. However, as an analogy, he said that if one is obsessing about everything a car needs all the time, i.e. if you're obsessing about your Shalom Bayit all the time, one of two things can happen. One, your eyes are off the road. You're not looking at the road because you're too busy, preoccupied with uh, making sure that Shalom Bayit, everything is good, everything is okay with the car. Or you don't get anywhere. Maybe you pull your car off the side, you're checking it, the engine, the tires, the wheels, the everything else. Okay, very good. You have a car. It's in great shape. But it's not going anywhere. So similar with this, with this notion of Shalom. Shalom is good, right? A country can't achieve anything if it's at war all the time because you're at war and your ability to get anything done is severely limited. So we need Shalom. Shalom is critical. But Shalom is critical in as much as you have a goal with which to a goal to achieve. If you're at Shalom, and then you just kind of rest and relax, it's kind of defeated the purpose. And the same thing is true with justice. We don't want injustices to be done, right? It'll just distract people. If people are constantly worried about getting robbed and getting mugged, about, about not being able to pursue any of their goals because they could get murdered on the street or, or, uh, or, um, or beaten up, well, you have some serious problems. You need to make sure that the society is a just society. But once it is a just society, now what? What's the goal? That's great. We trust the, the judicial system. Only people who are doing wrong things will be punished. People who are, who are being upstanding citizens will be let alone. But let alone again. Let alone to do what? For what purpose? That's the goal of this Mishnah. It's amazing. Uh, we never would have thought about it. But in the, the fact is, there's so much. There's so so many other things that are going on with um. With, uh, with his mission in context, a person could read and be like, Amazing, this is the reason for existence. And the answer is no. 
This is the means through which we can exist in order to achieve our goals that were, re that were iterated in the second mission of, of our parak. Um, and there's actually a really interesting Gemara in Shabbos. It's in Lamed Bet Amu Bet. And it says like this, Tanya, Rabbi Shmuel ben Elazar Omer. He says as follows, Babon Shnei Dvarim Ame Haratot Meitim. There are sin, there are two sins for which Ame Haratim, um, uh, ignoramuses, I guess, um, die. Al Shekorin Laron Akodesh Arna. The fact that they call the Aron Akodesh Arna, that means an Aron in Aramaic. So no, Kodesh, and it's in the, it's in the vernacular. And Val Shekorin Levet Akneset Beit Am. And so the fact that they call a synagogue um, a a beit am, like a, a house for for the people. And I've heard other commentaries about this, but even just on the most basic, it seems fairly straightforward. If a person looks at a synagogue, a place to engage God, a person to to speak to him, to relate to him, to come into close contact with him, and all they see are just a bunch of people all hanging out together, right? They're just it's like oh, it's so nice, it's like a social gathering. I mean. That's, I mean, according to the Gemara, um, my Aristotle will die for, the, for these things. Um, and it's hard to understand, like, why is that? But once we sink in to this uh, to this tour, the Rabbein Yonah, the Prisha, right, these two Mishnahs and how they contrast, it makes sense. Because the idea of, like, all these buildings is not just like, oh, we get to all hang out together. It's meant to serve a purpose. It is not the Tachli. They are a means to an end. And so with that, we'll actually go into uh, into some of the specifics in terms of we have Torah, we have Avoda, we have Gmul Chasad, and what is that? What is that? What do we know from each? So we'll speak about the first two briefly. So Torah, because the world was created for this. Um, we can see uh, we can say Mishle, right, which was quoted by the Rebbein Yona. It says Hashem Kanani Reishi Darko. So Amra Torah Nini Vreitu Fnei Nini Vreitu Fnei Kol Anivraim Vebavuri Nivru Kol Anivraim. Right, so this idea of Hashem Kanani Rishi Darko, so this is actually quoted in the very second Rashi of all of Chomish, right, in Breshit Bar al Kimit Aretz. So there Rashi says, and he quotes, the world is created for Torah. Why? Hashem Kanani Rishi Darko. This Pasuk. And how about the Avoda? How does that relate to the, the, the way in which the world, the world stands? So says the Prisha, says the Kodesh Baruch Hu chose Israel from all the peoples, right? That's also in that same Rashi. And uh, and he chose, the, and the Kodesh Baruch Hu also chose the Basin of as a place for us to serve him. So all these things are, again, the Torah, in terms of um, the way I've heard this iterated is, the Torah is God speaking to us. Avoda is us speaking to God. But the idea is there's this, uh, there's this relationship that's being engaged in by the Jewish people in particular, but all of humanity, humanity potentially, Less so with Torah, um, but the idea is there's a relationship being forged between uh, between us as the Jewish people and God. Fine. How about Pilon Chasadim? And the preacher himself points out he's like this is uh, this is a bit unusual because how does Pilon Chasadim relate to our relationship to God? That seems to be very um, other oriented in terms of um, other people oriented. So this is what he says. So the Ken Gun Chasadim, this is in the tour. Shehimidat Hachesed Hagoremet Liot Laratum Lifne Hashemit Barach. So, what exactly does that mean? That's a very interesting thing he says, right? The Ken Gun Chasadim, and so too Gun Chasadim, Shehimidat Hachesed, because that's a trait of loving kindness, Hagoremet Liot Laratum, that causes it to be like desirable before Hashemit Barach. What's desirable? It's almost like they're like missing words here. Like I understand what exactly is desirable. How is this? How is this desirable? Why is this desirable? What goes on? So the preacher goes into specifics and he says, um, with this, because God desires that we exercise this trait, this behavior, it actually gives him nachat, right? God wants us to act kindly to other people, and so by acting kindly to other people, that actually does fulfill His will. Um, but he goes into a separate explanation. Look, that's nice. You know, that, that sounds kind of intuitive, but he says, he says a, a really beautiful chiddush. He says, alternatively, because by, do, by doing gmiot chasadim, the ways of HaKadosh Baruch will be recognized as a loving kindness. How often do we think, I certainly thought this growing up, that uh, that God is this big guy with a big heavy stick and he'll, and he'll, and he'll beat us if we don't do what he wants. Uh, it's kind of scary. And not particularly appealing, quite frankly, um, to think of God in that manner. It's like, uh, 
you know, thanks, but no thanks. I'll, I'll do my own thing, and you can take your stick and uh, and just and leave it where it is, and I'll uh, I'll stay where I am. But but Rabbi Jack Cohen actually said this is really interesting. Is this is part of Avram Avinu's revolution? Avram Avinu, Avram Avinu wasn't simply a monotheist. And he wasn't simply a person who loved Chesed. It was actually specifically those two things that actually work together. God isn't, a, God isn't just a big guy with a stick who's going to beat us. It's specifically that God loves us and wants to manifest his kindness onto us. And it was specifically Abraham's recognition of this fact that then had him pursue Chesed on such a wide scale. That is to say, Abraham of being recognized that God was a God of loving kindness. And by reflecting that reality, in reality, in his own personal actions, he helped manifest God's, uh, God's ways on earth, and he helped bring many people closer to Akadosh Baruch Hu. And that, I think, is what the preacher is alluring, alluding to. When it says, when, when the Torah says, um, it means that, that us acting in our Torah different ways with our avoda, um, and then we go and we engage in Gun Chasadim, and that makes his raton, it makes God's raton um, look appealing. It makes it appear that God desired this for our good because, wow, look at this religious person. Look at all the chesed that he's doing. And if that, if the reason why he's doing this, if he's engaging in this, is because the Rish Baruch told him to do it, then it must be that there's there's some powerful, loving, kindness relationship that uh, that we want to engage in. So these are the comments of the Prisha. It's amazing. So we see that the reason, it's, while well, it's true, the Mishnah says, right? Like the world exists on three things, shalom. that's really just a, a means to an end to achieve our true goals of Torah, Vod, and Chasadim. That is the end of this first parak. Uh, amazing. It was long, but hopefully worthwhile. And we'll see you um, with the second parak of Pirkei Avot.